Good day, Anders. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, coming from Copenhagen, Denmark, Europe, this is uh, fantastic that Zoom can bring us together like this. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. Um, now, you and I have known each other online via social media for about a decade, and this is our first opportunity to kind of meet face to face, even, even though we're doing virtually. But, uh, but for our audience, could you please introduce yourself and, and give us a little bit about your background? And can, and, and can we start after you introduce yourself to where did you grow up? Well, Denmark, Europe, uh, close to Copenhagen, Hans Christian Andersen, uh, that's uh, the country over here. And uh, where I grew up in the West Coast, uh, in the, the big part of Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, if you would say like that, the West Coast in Jutland was born. Uh, in this area, there's farmers and there's teachers, uh, very much farmland and fishermen. So I was brought up by, by my, my mother and father there, born back in early 60s. So I'm that old now. Uh, so, uh, and really uh, moving then from the West Coast to the East Coast uh, and went to school from two years old, went to school, basic school, and then into college and, and uh, further on to, to uh, getting a BA and uh, getting a, a master's in finance and also uh, in business finance. So I'm, I'm a finance guy, you know, numbers and uh, stuff like that. I love numbers and love, love to measure stuff. Excellent. Well, thank you. So where do you live and work now? Well, I live still uh, in the East Coast, uh, just 30 kilometers outside Copenhagen in a small town called Hillerud. And in front of me here is a big castle by Christian IV, a uh, romantic castle. So I live just nearby. And uh, I work with Halfway International. I've done that for, yeah, since 2008. Uh, and that's a research company that you probably know. I don't know. I know you know. Yes, so I we, I worked there for almost uh, 12 years, been employed. But before that, I started Hathwaite in Denmark, uh, brought that to the Danish audience. You know, we're only five and a half million people in Denmark. So mm -hmm. it's a small, small nitty gritty state that looked into the US. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you did after you, you got your uh, finance degrees and what, what, what was your your career progression been? What jobs have you held and, and who have you held them with uh, on your way to Huffway? Well, I've been having a path since I was 18 years old uh, from the Danish multinational industries uh, within uh, devices, measuring devices, a group called FOSS, a, a global multinational where I started my, my, my journey, where I also got my degree in finance. Uh, and I worked very, yeah, by coincidence and by interest, I got into the board of directors as a representative for the employees. So I sat with some of the major and most wealthy uh, innovators and also uh, most wealthy companies since I was 18. So that has been a mag magnificent start to my career, but that career started in IT sector. So I was an IT guy, and then I moved into financial controlling, the numbers guy. And then we help the board and, and board of directors build the strategic plans and stuff like that. Mm, excellent. So that was the first job I really kickstarted my career from a, from a business point of view. And alongside that, I've, I've always done my own businesses. So I, you know, I'm a startup guy. So I started up being a musician in my spare time playing the drums. Uh, I started out, up when Atari made uh, music on computers for you know Cubase and and doing all that stuff digitally. Uh, I used my digital capabilities and then my music capabilities as a drummer to start up a music studio, alongside my my uh, career formal career, and that has been my life you know uh, formal career and then uh, my own companies alongside. Excellent. So um, my my the title of my series here is. HPT videos, uh, human performance technology, or it's known by many different names, performance-based improvement, et cetera. 
Uh, instruction is a part of that, but there's much more to it. Uh, the whole total quality management movement is to me a part of that umbrella of human performance technology. But, but uh, you're with Huthway, you do spin selling and all of that. So what was your first exposure to this world of uh, spin in particular and, and perhaps Neil Rackham as well? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting story. My second job, also in the family-owned company, uh, I was uh, exposed by coincidence to spin selling. I was responsible for a, a group in Scandinavia, a group CEO, and uh, that was a turnaround. We bought companies and turned them around, and uh, I had them responsible for 10 sellers in Denmark, the Danish subsidiary, and then I was a group manager for the Nordic company. And... Uh, we had to turn around and uh, build a company from 50 million Danish kroner. That's not a lot, but then we should make that grow organically and buy mergers and acquisitions. That was my role and task. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what happened when I did the analysis within the company, there were two high performers of those 12s. So I said, well, the simpler thing to do is, well, what do you do differently? What, what, what's your speciality? What are you doing? You get better prices, you get better margins. People love to talk to you and they come back to you all the time. And so they, they were my champs, you know? So, so, and they said, well, back some 10 years back from then, they had been at Hoover House in uh, England, our headquarter, and they had been brainwashed. They've been brainwashed with something called spin. <laughs> spin selling. And now, my ears, they were, they were really big and say, well, what's this about? And then they pointed me to the spin selling book. And this was before Christmas. So you can imagine I was going to read this book in Christmas, but I was so curious because we had to turn around fast and get the numbers right and get into growth. Then uh, I read the book, I bought it on Amazon, I read the book uh, and I was just amazed by the, the way it was written, the simplicity, the beauty of the numbers, you can measure salespeople. You can measure salespeople, really. So and I'm a numbers guy. So being a numbers guy, I said, this is it. Then we have to get those people spin trained. So I bought the book for everyone in the company, and they had to read that for Christmas. <laughs> and then after Christmas, uh, well, then we, uh, this is 2001. So I was exposed to this in 2001. And uh, then we did it. And... I was just as a manager implementing and I owned it, you know, and then my management team owned it. And when people owns it, well, things happen. So actually what we did with Spin, and that was my first touch with Spin, that was we grew the company from 50 million to 100 million Danish kroner in three years. And 20% of that was the organic growth from Spin and the rest was buying companies and consolidating. So that was really, and you know, the fun thing is, and that I've learned now also these years when you implement SPIN, some people don't want it because I know what the best is. So forget about me. So people left, but that was a poor performance that left, luckily. So a cheap way to get, get on and, and get the right people on the bus. And uh, then we had a standard and you know, SPIN selling is a standard. You can measure, you can benchmark. It's objective, it's so simple. And the beauty is you get suddenly, you know, conscious competent or incompetent. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that was, uh, you know, uh, people loved it. And the people who loved it, they, they just turned into high performance very fast. So it's an easy sell uh, for, for the people we onboarded. And it was just became the, the model we used in the group, the family and group as a, as a whole. And there, then I met, uh, because there was no Danish supplier to deliver spin. So I called Tony Hughes, uh, the owner. I said, what can we do? We don't have any, any people doing spin in, in Denmark. How do we get to be trained? And I was forwarded to, to our Norwegian uh, colleague. And uh, for some reason, he was out skiing. So he never called me back. And... Uh, then what happened, I called Tony, say, how, how about a trainer trainer? Then I'll do it. And then we'll take care of the Danish stuff. Uh, if you have people in Denmark who needs to be trained from the big businesses yourself, well, I'll be your trainer. And Tony bought, bought that and uh, 
ever since he's been my close friend and we've built business together for many years now. Very cool, very cool. I, as somebody who was exposed to uh, Neil Rackham and Spin Selling before the book came out at Motorola back in 1981 and 82, I've been a big fan of Neil and of Spin and some of the, uh, my job at Motorola was to bring in their win-win negotiations program. And I worked with a guy named John Carlisle for the book. And uh, it just, it just made so much sense. It's so logical. Yeah. It is, uh, and it's a win-win. It's really oriented to, you know, it's consultative selling and uh, it really, it really does that well. So you've been doing this for quite a while. And in uh, our conversation before we started the record, hit the record button for this video, uh, you were telling me a little bit about, you had a conversation with Neil a year ago, October, about some of the additional work that you've been doing. And can you, can you share with us a little bit about uh, what that conversation was about and how you've taken the spin model and perhaps you know, made some adaptations and extensions of it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because uh, we get often asked, uh, why spin selling? That's an old lady. So that's not modern, that's not challenger, that's not solution selling or whatever you, what have you. Now, what, what, what I found by understanding what spin really is, uh, and read all, all Nick's, Neil's books. So I, I, like you, I'm a big fan of him and he's a, he's a marvelous guy. So what I learned is that spin is an evergreen. If you really get what spin is, it's about psychology, it's about how that works and psychology with human beings don't change. So what has to change in an old lady that is a lovely old lady? <laughs> well, actually nothing except from content, well, how about context? Context has changed. We've like the internet, like getting virtual now, the context in which we persuade one another has changed, but the psychology has not. So having the discussion with Neil, uh, I was curious about uh, how he would see spin in the 21st century. Have, if he were to invent again, reinvent spin and observe, what would he have put in that but book, what would have been in that book today if it was launched now? And uh, because we discussed it about brain science, you know, how does spin resonate with all the brain science that we have out there now? It's psychology, so it should, it should resonate. It should be some kind of link. And he was very uh, thoughtful of that. And he said, Anders, you know, there is a link. And, and of course we can agree about, we love spin, so we agree of what it is, but it's psychology evergreen, the brain evergreen, maybe shrinking because we uh, do stuff we shouldn't do. But, but uh, really what he said, uh, I was curious about the knee payoff question. I was curious about the implication question, what that does to the brain. And you think of it, there's a link to the prefrontal cortex, the rational brain. So knee payoff question stimulates the rational brain turns us away from the fear brain, the limbic system, and the implication questions and problem-oriented questions like we haven't spent problem implication, they trigger the limbic system, right? So by, by seeing that perspective, it's evergreen. Spin in the 21st century triggers the same psychology, the same brain systems, and it makes logic to go from a burning platform with implica implication questions where you bring the customer into a burning platform and then bring them into how to solve that, the rationalities, and you know, calm down and see the value of change. So, so that resonated deeply with, with, with Neil, and he said, well, you've done stuff on that, and uh, he knew, of course, already. That's a link. So Spin is an old lady. She is more beauty than, beautiful than ever, and it works. And seeing on the clients I work with, it works. It's, it's, it's still a beauty. So, of course, Challenger came on uh, and, and, and changed the game for a while. And uh, Neil did stuff with them, but it was not behavioral stuff. Uh, so, so uh, but they did great stuff. And Matt and, and Brent that did the stuff, I talked with them, good friends of, mine, friends of mine, because they did something that changed the world of sales for a while. And then coming back to, how about Spin then? Well, Spin is still doing what challenges do. Uh, you just have to see how. 
So we have the behavioral research on how challenges look, and therefore we acknowledge the challenger is a way to go, but it's still spin. I'm go. familiar with, with challengers, so can you explain that to me and our audience? What's, what is that about? Well, it's still about psychology, isn't it? It's still about creating a burning platform. So when they say teach, tailor, uh, take control, well, some of the process is, is kind of marketing, uh, but it was not based on observational research. It was based on what people told. So it's a uh, non-observational research and correlated. And that's, that's great stuff. Most people do that, but at Hathway, we do observational research. Mm -hmm. so, so looking at challenges, I'm a challenger. You know, I'm a challenger because I've used some of the behaviors in my spin curriculum that are challenging or categorized now as challenging behaviors. But I know how they look like. I know how to construct a challenging behavior. Uh, and when you understand that suddenly, there's not much news to the old lady. We've done that before, but there's not many people doing it because they cannot, it's complex to do challenging behavior. But I do it, I do challenging behavior, but I know what, what is built in verbal behavior style. Thank you for that. And, and before we started again, uh, we, we talked a little bit about this uh, a thing you called ICE. And can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Because I think this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with SPIN, but not in depth. It's been a long time since I've read the book and, and uh, helped my clients uh, uh, help them develop training uh, scenarios for, for applying SPIN in their world. But so what was ICE about and, uh, and how do you use that? Well, in the research uh, that Neil did, we found a way to, to, to do the ICE acronym, identify, clarify, and extend. That's the functionality of the question types you use. Now, uh, this might become a little nerdy, so sorry for being going into depth of behavior analysis. It's, you know, the S is situation question, P is problem question. There's a hidden question, follow-up problem question below that. Uh, and the problem question is asking, what are your problems? Or do you have problems? And then you get the answer, yes, we have problems. That's a kind of vague answer, isn't it? Yes. Yes, we have problems. Then that should invite you, because you listen, that should invite you to ask the follow-up problem question to clarify. So you say, the problem guy, what are the problems? And then you, you get a clear, a clear understanding of what the problem is by the answer you get. This is still SP and, and the follow-up problem questions, two kind of problem questions. Mm -hmm. So let's identify, clarify the ICE, identify, clarify. And then the extender was there already the implication question. So you say you have issues with the IC system is too slow. And actually uh, you, you have in this specific area it, it, it holds the system uh, into 50% of the perform performance. That's a clear implied need now. Then I would ask, well, what are the consequences to your business? What are the consequences to you, Guy? How do you feel about this? So bringing the, the clear problem into a context of other problems. That's spin. And that's extending. So when you do the implication question, you extend. So ICE is actually another way of saying the functionality of S, P, I until I. And then we had the knee pair of questions. And then most people see only that there's a knee pair of question. But actually the knee pair of question that brings the burning platform, the consequences into, I want to solve that. Then you, are, you, you tend to ask questions and those are knee pair of questions. So what is it you want to do now, Guy? You have a big issue here, so what does you want to do? That's a clarifying knee pair of question. But back then we only had knee pair of questions as a big, big block of questions. But we found also that the ICE formula, there's three types of knee pair of questions. There's identifying knee pair of questions, there are clarifying knee pair, questions, knee pair of questions, and there's extending knee pair of questions. So like you ICE the explicit need or the implied need, the problems, you can also ICE the explicit needs. And learning those questions that are distinct verbal constructs. That is what we found in our later research that you have also extending the, the value 
of what you want. So I want a Ferrari and I want 18 rims, rims and I want with turbo and all the stuff. That's a clear, explicit need. But then I asked the extending question. So guy, you want that Ferrari with 18 rims and you know, the turbo? What is you want to do with that? What is the value you're looking for? Well, I, go, I want to go to Paris in my Ferrari together with my girlfriend. And I'll show off in the Champs-Élysées, streets of Champs-Élysées, yeah? Oh, now I know the value of having a Ferrari together with a girlfriend and the value story, yeah? So that kind of question that asks for the value, not only what you want, but what value it will bring you if you get that. That is icing the explicit need. So there's three types of need pair of questions, uh, subcategories in verbal behavior, you can say. And that is what spin is today. Uh, and e even more, I could, I could go out for hours. Spin in the 21st century, Neil, he said, and you asked that question, Neil said, what would he do differently if he were inventing or bringing out the book in these modern terms with times with you know, virtual selling, what would we add to that nine verbal behaviors? And he said, two more behaviors. And those two more behaviors are listening behaviors. And the one is testing understanding. You, you remember that from the negotiation curriculum, I know. Yes. And the other one is summarizing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Kai? Oh, it does. I. Uh, when I saw all of that back in 81, 82, I simplified it for myself to use. And I found myself every time I was talking with a client or anybody in my personal life, I was categorizing what I heard from myself. Was I giving information? Was I seeking information? Was I testing understanding? Was I summarizing? And then part of my favorite was the old defend and attack. Um, yeah, yeah, defend attack. That's remember, negotiation skills survey. Yeah, oh, I, I remember them talking about the defend attack spiral and how things would spiral out of control when it was just a series of defense uh, attacks and then a defense and then more attacks and more defense. And one of the things I learned from John Carlisle, who, who I learned most of this from, was that the only way to, to break that defend attack spiral was to either seek information, test understanding, or summarizing. And it was along the lines of, so you think I'm a jerk? Yeah. The incredulous, <laughs> incredulous testing understanding that I learned from my master trainer. Incredulous testing understanding. That's a beauty. That's a nerdy stuff. You, you and I, you, you, you know. <laughs> but let's not bore, let's not bore the, the viewers here. It's, it's, uh, it can be too, too nerdy, I think. I, I, well, it can. And, and we should encourage them all to uh, read Spin Selling, and the other books, and, and I'm gonna put in the show notes for the video here, links to your websites and to your blog, and people can get even more there uh, in terms of you know, what's going on with SPIN today, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to the, you know, what was published uh, in the book back in 1988. Mm -hmm. But let SPIN me is more alive this. than ever. Pardon me? SPIN is more alive than ever, actually. I I, I think so. I, I, I see no reason why it's just, uh, you know, it's basic psychology, as you said. I, I remember Bill Wiggenhorn at Motorola uh, making the comment one day that it's really the Socratic method applied to sales. And I always like that too. So, it, you know, the, the, you just have to be worried about hemlock, I guess. Uh, let me shift gears here a little bit. Uh, so if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what it is you do as, a, as an example, as a model for our audience, how, how, you know, if you were at a neighborhood party and there's new neighbors and they don't know, you know, you and what you do and they ask you, you know, Andrews, what do you do? What, <laughs> what would you, what would you say to them? How do you position yourself with a, you know, 30 second elevator speech or, you know, some spiel like that? Well, to initiate that, I would say I help human beings get better faster. Then you can double click on that. Say, okay, within what field? Mm -hmm. Get better, faster selling, complex selling. Get better, faster negotiating. Get better, faster coaching other people. Get better, faster also communicating. So you've taken, so I, I'm assuming now based on what you just said is that not only do you teach 
spend selling, but you teach the win-win negotiations or whatever it's called nowadays. Yeah. I, this was this was from way back. But there's other applications. And can you share with us a little bit about, you know, what why would somebody want to come to you and have you help them learn to do things better? What are the other arenas besides sales and negotiations where you can help? The other regions, uh, well, getting a being a better manager, you know, if you want to embed change, we need better managers. So if you want to be, become, instead of a manager, a leader, well, the curriculum, the verbal curriculum, and also the, the, the nonverbal curriculum that, that we, we now add to the curriculum of Pathway, uh, that can be measured, uh, that can be controlled, that links with high performance, like your, your expertise. Well, that is where we, we, we see uh, people come to us today, not only about selling, but the leadership of selling. Mm -hmm. And you can say, uh, chunking uh, spin together into what it is today, it is being an agile seller. It's about doing your spin, doing your advanced spin, you know, the account strategy curriculum from also Neil's research, but added to the new level. And then of course the negotiation, that's the kind of selling curriculum but now, now comes the leadership coaching curriculum that really can up numbers by 20 to 40%. If you have a nice leader, well, people will stay and they'll grow and performance will grow. So do you, do you apply this just to, I don't know, standard coaching or whatever? Because one of the things I remember from back in 81, 82 is that Neil didn't want to train salespeople on spin selling. He wanted to train managers to be coaches of spin selling so that they would set expectations, they would observe salespeople on their sales calls, they would reinforce and give them corrective feedback and all that. And if I remember this correctly, it was Motorola, they did a, they did a pilot session up in Canada across the, several of the provinces <coughs> and there was a recession. And there was the groups that were trained because there was the control group. The control groups got angry because their sales all tanked during the recession. Whereas the other groups that got the training, their sales went sky high. And so the control group executives rebelled and said, no, you've got to give us that training too. We're, we don't want to be in your control groups anymore because it impacted their bonuses, et cetera. But but then they also made a demand of Neil that he not just have training for the sales managers as coaches, that they he they insisted, and this was some tension back at uh, our organization as we were working with Neil to to help them put this together. It was I wasn't involved directly with that group, but I remember hearing all the stories. Um, but then they came about and created the training for the salespeople. So so I always thought that the the whole approach and the and the behaviors the communications behaviors as i called them um were critical to managers and just anybody who is going to be a coach the whole giving information seeking information testing understanding summarizing and all the rest of those behaviors were critical building upon others ideas and all that stuff as you build work with teams and as a team leader as just any coach uh, any manager job yeah, yeah. to be a critical uh a component of all this and uh you know i've I, it's just impacted me so much since those days here that uh, i still feel like i'm i'm using some of those things and perhaps clumsily but uh, i still use the things that i learned back then so so besides helping managers be better managers are there other applications that you've fo focused on here well the delivery of spin has changed a lot the last uh, 10 years and the delivery mechanisms, you can say. So yes. doing a, a five-day spin program back then has been squeezed into a two-day blended, you know? Mm -hmm. But what's happening now is with the virtual and all the digital putting some behavior change through pretty fast is yeah. actually collaborative learning. Mm -hmm. My good friend in Ericsson uh, is uh, responsible for sales enablement, uh, George Pastidis. He is writing, working with very innovative stuff about peer coaching. You know about the social, uh, the, the feeling safe when you are working? Yes. Having a safe environment to learn in. 
having your manager as coach is not always a safe environment. True. So how do we create a, a safe environment? And working with the, the likes of, of George Ericsson's and the IBM's and what have you, this, the sales forces and all that. Well, you need to find a way to implement behavior change in a very tight time schedule. Well, managers there reporting to the top, not having time. And uh, I think the way uh, peer coaching is coming up now is if you have a standard like spin, if you know what excellent looks like or good looks like, like Neil said, if you know what good, good looks like in behavioral terms, then you teach your people that. And then you start growing coaches, peer coaches. And what we see happening out there is having peer coaches, either colleagues, having the same success reference like spin, they can talk together, they have a common language. So yeah. we can observe one another in a safe environment, right? So training people with coaching skills and what we found was that six years ago, we found that spin is actually a coaching language with few modifications. So if you have learned spin as a seller, then you can coach your peer. And that's quite building friendships, building retention in the organization. And if you have a great, if you come to have a great manager who's a good coach, they are very rare species. But when you have that, you also see retention of people staying on because they have a great leader. He's a great coach. So how do you breed coaches? I think all of my colleagues around the world, they have an issue here. It's not an easy task. So how do we breed good coaches? Well, we start with having peers coaching one another, giving them just a few extra behaviors and a structure that they can coach one another. That's a safe environment. Uh, other companies, they do like this. They say, well, your manager should not coach the employee. But how about building a, a, all the great coaches in a good big organization like, like IBM or Ericsson how about finding the great coaches and they coach their peers mm -hmm. in other parts of the organization. And that works extremely well. And it's extremely safe to fail. Also, even in American organizations, you can fail by failing not in front of your manager, but failing in front of a friend. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to a guy? Oh, it, it, it's, it's fascinating. And I, I see the logic of it. And, uh, I, you know, it's a, it's a great extension of uh, that original research. So, so you, Hathwaite has continued to do observational research of people. You've you've uh, alluded to that earlier, and uh, and can you can you share with us, you know, where we where are we in the numbers here? I mean, spin when the book came out, I forget how many, you know, it was fifty thousand observations or something like that. And I know the numbers kept on growing in terms of how the model has been validated in terms of, you know, what kinds of communications behaviors are used at what point of the sales cycle, short sales cycles and longer sales cycles and the beginning at the end and the middle of a sales call. I know that there were, that was all being modeled, um, very sophisticated, uh, um, I think. Where has all that gone? Well, the, it's still in the basement and we have added to what is in ba the, the Cinderella, we say Cinderella is in the basement. Uh -huh. uh, and, and she is, and uh, we have taken back some of Neil's original stuff. We brushed that off because you know what? You know what the major demand is these days in the selling audience or the clients around? What are the major explicit needs you would see in the world right now? I, tell me, I don't know. Virtual selling. Oh, virtual, sure. Or communicating in a virtual world. Mm -hmm. We have been bombarded with requests for, can you teach us how to sell virtually? Or can you tell us how to communicate? Just communicate. This is a new world for us and we look like garbage. Uh, so we would like to look good and do what the best do in this environment. So the last, since we were hit by COVID also, of course, here in, in mm -hmm. Hoover and so on. So we, of course, did some observations through the last eight months and observe what's good. It's easy to observe here, you know, to do observe, observation research, that's easier now. Mm -hmm. so, so we have looked into what is it we see when people are successful. And bing, something is not new, something is old. 
and we brought that we brought that uh, research added to to what we feel is now appropriate in the context of the 21st century but it works so yeah. i'm not only you know you know you sit here with zoom for many many months now so you know that i articulate more the the nonverbal language has to come into place mm -hmm. i have to be more a variety i have to be engaging but more than ever you have to ask questions so spin for virtual selling is a no-brainer and people still and I, I don't understand why we have been for a de five decades and people still feature dump yeah people still do tell sell people still do even though we have had solution selling all the, the different kinds of selling people still do what they just do so that's lucky for us still people need to know how to ask questions and the beauty of the questions and the testing understanding summarizing and a few more of course that is that is actually opening the eyes of being a virtual seller is a big big challenge because it's not only being a seller it is being a meeting organizer it's being the chair of the meeting like you chaired me before you said well we do like this we prep this conversation we have some cues we have some things we do to make it look good and persuasive it needs prep but the same psychology a few more behaviors but the same psychology does that make sense yeah, I mean, it, it does. Your verbal world. Well, I I I see the logic of it. It's uh, of course there's the secret sauce of the specific you know behaviors and when and how to use them and all of that. So, it, but it's fascinating. I don't want you to share all of that stuff here. Hopefully, we'll we'll get people to beat a path to your door uh, because you've got a, a new and improved spin on the spin selling model and uh, doing this virtually. But I think that that's, it is important because the virtual world is different than typical face-to-face -face interactions. And, uh, and, and because, and if you're doing team selling, you know, uh -huh. it's uh, everybody understanding the, the game plan for a particular call and for the entire sales cycle, if you see it as being a longer cycle than a, short cycle sales um yeah i think that it's 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 just fascinating um but and and yeah we're getting a little nerdy here but i don't mind it at all i have another question here i'm going to shift gears here on you and uh you know you're a lifelong learner you're an avid reader you told me earlier and uh, so can you share with us where are you focused in learning what's what's your next learning curve that you're trying to climb um and how are you going about it? Yeah, the big the big thing here that everyone is seeking uh, for the easy fix. Um, that is what happens after the training. Now you said that like I'm an everlasting learner, so we never stop learning. We jump a learning journey, and then it never stops. That's the first mindset you need to have. But the thing about when you get out there doing the workplace transfer from having learned something new, understood what you learned, try to practice in a behavioral context so you can actually do what you think you can do, uh, then making that stick in the workplace. Yeah. That stick in, in a cost effective way. Mm -hmm. You can always employ uh, you know, coaches and pay a fortune. And you can employ good coaches and you will win a fortune. And, and but but the thing is, how can we how can we make that even more effective? Because our clients are asking for that thing, the workplace transfer thing. They can do the training and all the stuff, but they still haven't found the holy grail for the workplace transfer. So you learn on the fly. But we believe right now we are we are we're doing that, and of course of course we are experimenting with innovative clients that dare do stuff today, like Motorola's, like IBM's. There are people out there daring to do something. And we dare, we dare together with them. So, so trying to fix that you know, gap where we use the new behaviors instead of supporting them, making them sticky. So that, that's a collaborative approach 
where people learn, learn from people, peer, peer learning, and how to, to do that easily. Yeah. So people want to do it. You know, if people, they really uh, like something and want something, they get it, they do it. So how to create that uh, motivation inside, intrinsic motivation, say, well, I want to learn all my life, and now I'm learning together with my peers. How to get that curriculum of best practices in there so they stick. And that's, that's really where I am at now. And, and we are doing great stuff with, with Halfway team and, you know, again, nerdy, how to make this easy and scalable. Because we work with, you know, big organizations and they want scalability, not just in Copenhagen with five people. Mm. I can do that. I can coach them forever. But how to scale that coachability and, and that workplace transfer so it sticks. That transfer. Be, Transfer has been a huge issue since I got into the business in 1979, and it's too not paid attention to. We we train him, we push him out there, and uh, you know, wish him good luck. But 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 I can see the point here because the reinforcement that's needed, and I remember Neil talking about this and why he wanted sales managers to be coaches, but they couldn't go on every single sales call. They could only go on a, on a small sampling of them. And, you know, if, if it's not an easy sale, um, then people might get discouraged and revert back to what they were more comfortable with earlier as they're, you know, you try out new things here. So transfer has always been a huge issue. Are you writing? Is there, are there places for people to go to learn about uh, what you're learning about transfer? Uh, you know what, I would, I would not, I, I thought about writing a book about social selling, but you know, no. It's, it's not worth that effort uh, and because it changes so fast, you know, new mechanisms, new technology. So why, why try to build something that is not of value tomorrow when you've read the book one year from now? So what I think we have uh, our thought leader at Pathway, Robin Hoyle. Robin and the team, uh, Sean and Nick and, 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 you know, not the dinosaurs of Pathway, but the, the people who really guess what Pathway is. They're doing magic. They're doing magic back, back home right now. And I'm lucky as a salesman because I'm a business developer. I'm a lucky as a salesman to have that team to help and inspire, but also for us to inspire them with what we see out there. Uh, so, so Robin Hoyle, I follow Robin Hoyle. He's, he's doing magical things with the workplace transfer uh, and uh, some of the stuff he shares, uh, Talheimer. Talheimer is another guy you should follow uh, that we follow because he's doing magic with measurement. Uh, so we are on the innovative side. We, we, we have to develop a new thing. And actually the way halfway it develops is about, we're not developing anything. The best out there are developing everything. So the champs out there, what are they doing differently today? We should find those whatever challenges or spinners or whatever but we know the behavior, that's our, that's what we need to own. That is the behaviors needed. Not, not what, what we think it is, but what we know it is. Yeah, if you find the exemplar performers, the top performers, the master performers and figure out what is it that they're doing? How are they doing it? I think that that was all, that's one of the lessons I got from Neil is that he, he often said that he didn't want to look at poor performers and understand what they were doing. He didn't want to look at average performers and understand what they were doing. He wanted to look at the top performers and understand what they were doing and get everybody to do that. <laughs> um, and, and not try to worry about where are people starting from necessarily, although that's always part of it, not trying to focus on that and try to uh, model that, if you will, but just understand what, what those exemplar performers were doing. Um, and that's still, you know, that's still what we do, Guy. That's it's still that's it's that simple, but not not many people afford that money to go into doing that research because it's expensive. Yeah. So we tend to find clients that want to to you know do things together. So we mm -hmm. do it so they get a signature stuff. Yeah. We have in the in the hotel industry, we had a client some years ago that where we did signature stuff. So developing behaviors that only they use. So we find a behavior and they pay for that, of course, and then that's their behavior. Yeah, excellent. So trying to differentiate yourself in the utmost understanding of differentiation, that is what we can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I could go on forever, guys. Sorry, I'm just uh, so passionate about this. So uh, I get it. I know that'd be fine. If, 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 if you had unlimited time, I would stick here on Zoom with you for the unlimited time. But I know that you have uh, other things you need to go off and do. But uh, so my next question here is um, uh, uh, getting close to our wrap up here is who are some of the people that have influenced you in your career? And what I'm looking for is names so that our audience might decide to follow up on them because if they were good influences for you, they might be good influences for them. So who would you call out and uh, what is it that they, what was it that, that, that you learned from them? So who, what, who within, within the selling community or within the, in general? It, 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 selling and in general, I think. So, cause we all need to know who's, who were the exemplars that had major impact to people who are successful. Mm. So they mm. learn from. Well, we have to mention the guy, Neil Rackham, definitely. If I have met Neil Rackham's book when I was 20 years old, I would have been in a different place. Money-wise, life-wise. Uh, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. It's not about money uh, only, but it's really, I would have loved to have read the spin book. If I was 20 years old today, I would still read the book from 1988 because there's so much magic in that book, so much simplicity. It's still psychology. I would read that book anytime. And I would also, that influenced my selling. So my success in selling is based on spin and account strategy. So as again, Neil, uh, the book you read about account strategy and the variations you did of managing uh, that. It's, it's, it's a little uh, narrow, isn't it? <laughs> but also I would mention, I would mention still uh, uh, our good friends and competitors uh, that are helping us, Brent and Matt, that they did challenge you. That shaped the, the world of selling. But really, you know, we need that. And uh, we find our feet and they find our feet and, and things change. So we should be ready and agile to take that. And I read Challenge Sale, of course, good book. Also the, the books that Brent he have, has written after that and Matt. Uh, so that's inspiring read. Um, also a guy called Jay Sealer Resch. Jay Sealer Resch from INSEAD. He has written a book back in 2006 called The Momentum Effect. And that book, like Blue Ocean Strategy, uh, those impacted my life back in the mid uh, 2000s. So, but that's very, you know, that's very much business books. Uh, and I read a lot of them, of course. And then I have one over here. Good friend of ours. I was in, uh, alluded to this by Robin Hoyle, our uh, thought leadership guy. This book, Emma Weber, mm -hmm. Turning Learning into Action. She is doing great stuff and, and, and people, our clients are loving her for the way she does workplace transfer. So I'm inspired by, by the simplicity of what she does here and I would, would recommend reading that book. Uh, she works with corporations like uh, BMW, I think and uh, is doing very well. Uh, she, just, she just cracked the code for some of this workplace transfer stuff. So that, that's, a, that's a new book. So recommend that. Uh, I think that's, that's many. I have, a, you know, I have a big bookshelf like you have behind you, even, you know. Yeah, but I would say Neil, he tops them all. He really does. No, I agree. Well, thank you for uh, identifying those people and those uh, resources, and hopefully our audience will uh, follow up on them. Um, let me uh, our, wrap up our interview here, but I, my final question is, what uh, parting words of wisdom or guidance would you have for people that are getting new into, I think sales, we can, we can focus on sales, but people are getting new into sales. What, what, what would you... Uh, say to them uh, as they begin the journey and start climbing the learning curve and getting better uh, performance wise, what guidance would you have for people entering into the sales arena? Pretty simple. It's Greek. Know thyself. <laughs> 
now I have to ask uh, uh, some probing questions on that. So, so what's so what do I need to know about myself? And 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 then I, you know that's that should help me lead uh, off into some place. But am I looking for my strengths? Am I looking for my weaknesses? Decode that for me. Yeah, I will. I will. It's it's uh, it's all about being confident. You know, confident sellers they know themselves. They know they are. From Ken Blanchett, we got situational based leadership, didn't we? And uh, we added the verbal curriculum to, to that leadership framework. We even work with Ken Blanchett, I, I was told. So when he, he, he did that framework, actually it goes from, you start to think you're competent, then you know you're suddenly conscious is incompetent, like you ride a bike for the first time, consciously incompetence, you, 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 you tip over. So know thyself is taking that journey from know that you're not competent, work with that professionally. So you know now I'm incompetent, but I know. So my awareness and consciousness now is focused on that. And then you can do your skill development thoroughly. So by knowing yourself that now I know that I can do what the best do out there. I know that, you know, I go, in the, I go into a selling uh, situation this morning and I was well prepared, confident. It was virtual. So I did every best practice that Neil has ever taught anyone. And I had the client sitting, wow, Anders, you know, this meeting was great. I got to know something I didn't know before this meeting. When are we going to meet again? So knowing that I would get that wow from the client because I knew I would, most likely, most likely because the world is the world, you know. So being consciously competent, or also the day where you get into the room, I'm not prepared. Well, I can expect that I will not deliver a wow experience, but I know. Not many salespeople have that conscious competence, but that is what they should know by themselves. Say, now I know I'm good. Now I know I'm half good, but I know. So know thyself first. Don't think about guy, is he, is he bored now? Well, I can think maybe his border is just sitting like this is just love what the, what is being told but don't bother about guy know what you're doing and virtual selling you should know how you look what you're doing and uh, not about guy if you're doing right guy will love this so that, i think that that double clicks a little what i mean by know thyself i get it uh thank you for that uh, explanation anders uh uh Thank you so much for your time today. And uh, I, again, will put uh, the appropriate links into the YouTube show notes so that people can follow up with you and uh, learn a little bit more about you and your spin on spin, so to speak. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great day. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.